This week, prevent the impact of a Linux worm. Yubico recalls FIPS YubiKey tokens after a flaw dis is discovered. How fraudulent domains hide in plain sight. Samsung reminds us to scan our TVs for viruses and then wants you to forget that they said that. Uh, the scraping of millions of Venmo transactions is a feature, not a bug, and more. In the expert commentary, we welcome Sagi Barzva. He's the strategic pre-sales manager from Tufin to talk about using automation to improve your security posture and taking that automation journey. All that and more on this episode of Hack Naked News. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show that brings you the security news each week. And despite popular belief, we do wear pants. It's Hack Naked News. Let the team at Black Hills Information Security test your defenses. With over 10 years of experience in penetration testing, red teaming, and threat hunting, the testers at Black Hills will help you find the holes in your security before the bad guys do. The team at Black Hills cares about educating and sharing their knowledge by creating countless blogs, open source tools, and webcasts for you to learn more about the tradecraft of pen testing and red teaming. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash BHIS to join their mailing list and view the latest blogs and webcasts from Black Hills Information Security. Welcome to Hack Naked News, episode 223 for June 18th, 2019. I'm, of course, your host, Paul Asadorian. <clears throat> Make sure you register for our upcoming webcast with Domain Tool, Salt Stack, and ISC Squared, and Viavi Solutions, all kinds of webcasts where we offer you some free training and knowledge uh, about general security topics in addition to getting an inside look at what solutions vendors offer. So make sure you go to securityweekly.com forward slash webcast and all of our webcasts are archived on demand at securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. Now for the news. Prevent the impact of a Linux worm by updating Exim CVE 2019-10149. I think this is awesome that Microsoft is doing a good job of protecting its Azure customers from running uh, Linux with vulnerabilities, uh, so much so that they've made an announcement to put and put protections in place. This week, uh, the MSRC confirmed the presence of an active Linux worm leveraging a critical remote code execution vulnerability in Linux Exim email servers running Exim versions 4.87 to 4.91. Azure customers running VMs with Exim 4.92 are not affected by this vulnerability. Azure has controls in place to help limit the spread of the worm from the work they've already done to combat spam, but customers using vulnerable software should patch as they are still susceptible to infection. Yubico has recalled the FIPS YubiKey tokens after a flaw is found. Yubico, Yubico stated, where the first set of random values used by the YubiKey FIPS applications after each device powered up have reduced randomness for the first operations performed after that YubiKey FIPS uh, device is powered up. The buffer holding random values contains predictable content left over from the FIPS power up self test, which could affect cryptographic operations, which require random data, of course, until the predictable content is exhausted. If you own one of these affected devi devices, the weaknesses exist in the YubiKey FIPS, YubiKey Nano FIPS, YubiKey C FIPS, and the YubiKey C Nano FIPS, you can get a replacement depending on where you purchased your device. <clears throat> Mirai has an offspring. Mirai has many offsprings. This recent one is called EchoBot. It's using 26 different exploits. Um, commenting on this article is Akamai's Larry Cashdollar saying a new version of Echobot uses, in fact, 26 different exploits for infection, most of which target well-known command execution vulnerabilities in various network devices. No CVE numbers were assigned for some of these flaws, although public advisories have been published. The exploit tar exploits target devices from ADM, Ubiquities, AeroS, Asmax, Asus, Belkin, Blackbot, DDWirt, Dell, D-Link, Linksys, and more. Samsung reminds, um, reminds us to scan our smart TVs for viruses. That's right. This is actually a feature on your TV. 
my TV was doing weird things and I, I saw this feature and so I scanned it for viruses and it, it didn't find any. Um, but Samsung on Sunday sent out a tweet urging people to check their Samsung smart TVs for viruses uh, and then deleted the message as if someone realized that highlighting risks posed by connected TVs may be bad for business. Perhaps that's what the register, of course, is uh, speculating. The Twitter post uh, sent by Samsung uh, manufacturers at Samsung support account remains preserved due to the Internet's archives way back machine. And the tweet read, scanning your computer uh, for malware viruses. Malware vi okay. That's what it said. All right, I'm reading the quote. Scanning your computer for malware viruses is important to keep it running smoothly. This also is true for your QLED TV if it's connected to Wi-Fi. Prevent malicious software attacks on your TV by scanning for viruses on your TV every few weeks. Here's how. And then posted a video. They have since removed the tweet. Uh, not sure exactly why. We can always speculate uh, as to why that's happening. Uh, maybe, maybe there's some you know, false negatives with it was my concern when I ran it. Uh, certainly on my TV. How fraudulent domains hide in plain sight. This article states more than three quarters of businesses found lookalike domains posing as their brand. Article coming up about that in some uh, efforts by Google inside of Chrome to prevent against this. Researchers at Proofpoint Digital Risk Protection discovered as part of the 2019 domain fraud report nearly 96% had exact matches for their brand-owned domain with a different top-level domain, for example, .NET or any of the other top-level domains. Um, so look, yes, these are sponsors. However, uh, two are sponsors, one is not. They can help you protect against this. Domain Tools has tools such as FishEye and other brand protection tools in their suite of products that work very well. In fact, we use them here at Security Weekly. Thinkst also makes uh, canary tokens available for free, which will trigger if someone else is running your web code um, and not a sponsor. JScrambler has tools to make it extremely difficult for attackers to read and or run your JavaScript code. So there are some potential solutions for you to this serious problem that was posed in the article this week. Serious vulnerabilities in the Linux kernel allow for remote denial of service attacks. The flaws are related to how the kernel handles TCP selective acknowledgments uh, or SAC packets with low minimum, uh, also ones with low minimum segment sizes, so MSS. Those packet nerds will know exactly what I'm talking about. These flaws could impact many devices, including servers, Android, smartphones, and embedded devices. Exploitation involves sending specially crafted packets to the target device, and some believe the flaws could have significant and widespread impact. There is much more technical information available from the folks at Red Hat. Uh, they've got a great write-up that goes through all the, the header fields and the source code. So make sure that you check that out. I hope to cover that flaw in a little more detail this week on Paul Security Weekly. A critical flaw is exposing TP-Link Wi-Fi extenders to remote attacks. This is a really easy flaw to exploit. Like If you just go look at the picture in the original post, I mean, it's basically their tacking on a system command in a user agent field to execute remote commands as root. Uh, the article states the issue affecting TP-Link extend TP extenders rather is tracked to CVE 2019-7406, can be exploited by a remote and unauthenticated attacker via a specially crafted user agent field in the HTTP header. Since all processes on impacted extenders run with root privileges, one of the many flaws in the design and security design specifically of embedded devices. An attacker can, of course, execute arbitrary shell commands with elevated permissions and take complete control of the device. Uh, TP-Link does have a patch for this particular vulnerability. Uh, Venmo transaction scraping is back in the news. Independent researcher Dan Salomon was able to scrape together millions of Venmo transactions over the course of six months and warned that users set their payments to private after privacy researchers warned the company that users' public activity can still be easily obtained. Of course, this is on purpose and not the first time researchers have pointed this out. Still, Venmo, in my opinion, should give the user a clear notification that transactions are being shared or even better, set it to default to private. New Google Chrome protections from deception. Looks like we get two new features. One is an extension 
With the Suspicious Site Reporter extension, you can help safe browsing, protect web users by reporting suspicious sites. You can install the extension, start seeing an icon when you're on a potentially suspicious site, and more information about why the site might be suspicious. By clicking the icon, you're now able to report unsafe sites to safe browsing for further evaluation. The other is really just common sense, a new warning that works by comparing the URL of the page you're currently on to the URLs of pages you've recently visited. If the URL looks similar and might cause you to be confused or deceived, they'll show you a warning that helps you get back to safety. We'll take a short break and come back for expert commentary uh, with Saki from Tufin. Stay tuned. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from 0 to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Welcome back everyone to Hack Naked News. Um, I don't have another now. All I have to do is introduce our guest, Saggy Barsvi. He's the strategic pre-sales manager at Two Fin. Saggy, welcome to the show. Hey Paul, how are you doing? Good to I'm, be here. I'm doing great. And I, you know, it's interesting. We had Jeremy Winter from Microsoft on talking about Azure and he very much described the transformation to cloud and usage of all this new technology, specifically for automation, as a journey. And you have the same explanation, and I can tell you from personal experience, even going from traditional development to a DevOps environment where there's a lot more automation, that it's a journey. So what's with this journey? <laughs> uh, uh, it's an interesting question. Um, so, you know, the journey is, uh, that's actually, there was also a compelling event from my side. I uh, spent the last couple of weeks in some user conferences, mm -hmm. got some feedback from actual users, customers, people who are doing automation um, day to day on their daily basis, obviously. And uh, interestingly enough, it is a journey, right? So uh, we talk about starting making changes in an automated fashion. So, you know, we in Tufin, we define ourselves as a security policy company we are the security policy and i've been asking some questions around security policy how do you manage your security policy how do you automate it so you know if you look at um classic infrastructure type of thing we're looking at firewalls we talked about cloud azure is one example all the other you know um obviously aws google cloud as well um and then you have also containers so it's a really heterogeneous environment um really interesting um how the automation journey starts when you look at introducing new rules and creating rules in your security policy. But then later on, the question that I always ask is, what happens once you have the rule? How do you automate that part? So again, right? You start off with the journey. You take a crawl, walk, run type of thing. You mm -hmm. introduce new changes. You start manually. You go to automating it. And then the second part is, what happens once it's already in there, who maintains it? Who automates it? What happens to the rule lifecycle as we define it? Mm. Um, and again, it can be a firewall rule, or it can be any other rule, or any other rule that is part of the security policy. Yeah. No, it, and I, I love how you frame it that, you know, you've done it manually, right? In, in any of these different scenarios, you know, for example, our database lives in Amazon RDS, right? So sure, you've got experience. Hopefully, you've gained some experience. Maybe you haven't. But... You've got a, you know, a database server and you have to manage permissions. There's a lot of different ways to control access in a database server, for example. Traditionally, right, that was done in the database itself. That was done probably with external firewall rules uh, for some time. Now yeah. you're moving it to the cloud and now databases are spinning up, new applications are spinning up. These policies become very dynamic. They also can become stagnant in the cloud and get buried in Amazon security groups, as many of us are probably shaking our heads, right? Yes, yeah. they get buried yeah, in there. Exactly. And then, you know, how do you keep up with them? But I think having that that knowledge of this is how it's done in an on-premise type of environment, adding the rules manually, and then applying your security controls to it in a more automated fashion in the cloud is is really what I think you mean by the journey in this context. 
A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So a question I always ask, Paul, is uh, so you, as I said, you have the rule. Um, how do you keep, let's say, recertifying it? So it can be in Amazon. It can be, so in, if you look at the cloud infrastructure, it's there um, for some time, but not as much time as the classic infrastructure, which is, let's say, a firewall rule. A firewall rule can be there for years. Mm. Um, you know, assuming that something trans someone transition, no one owns this rule specifically, no one you know knows what's going on with this specific rule, how do you keep recertifying it? And that's something that we are tackling as well as part of the automation journey. And you know, talk about the next step of automation because we everyone talks about automation, um, and eventually it's all about automating the process, right? And again, it's a journey. You start off manually, you do peer reviews, you take a look at things, and then you move over to the next step of automating things as you feel more and more comfortable with it. And automation is so key. I mean, we've got, you know, a very small number of applications and users here at Security Weekly. Mm -hmm. And I can still find, uh, you know, things that get stale and things that need to be automatically updated. So when we spin up new applications, right, there's a rule that gets added. When that application spins down and we transition releases, those rules get updated, right? I can do that manually yeah. if, I, if I had to for one application. However, when we talk about enterprises, now you've got thousands Stop. of applications, right? Stop. Thousands of database yeah. instances. Uh, how do you know like what state each of them are in? How do you push security policies moving forward? Uh, you need automation, <laughs> you know, for that. And something that's going to intelligently try and figure out what is allowed to talk to what and give the analyst a view to uh, review exceptions and DevOps the automated ways uh, in which they can spin up a new application and it has access. When they spin it down, it doesn't, right? So you mentioned, uh, you talked about application, which is very interesting because that's where you would be surprised to know how, like, for example, Toofin is a security policy company, is kind of a hub of so many things, right? You just mentioned application, which is mm. in a nutshell, probably has so many entails into that specific application. Um, systems, other, other systems that are in charge of securing things, managing the application, how do you integrate that into the automation uh, platform? And we talk about security, how do you manage vulnerabilities? How do you open those requests? You said automating, right? But something has to control these. So an ITSM, a ServiceNow type of thing, mm -hmm. um, even Ansible, if you're talking about application, can be managing application that way. And then integrating all of that into automating that process um, I think that's, you know, that's, that's very interesting transition that we see in this world um, that suddenly this thing is, is actually a centralized system that takes either API or any other type of integration you can think of, takes all of that information inside to provide the user with as much comfortable as he, as he can be, as much comfortable as possible with making a change or letting the system as I said, the journey making the letting the system do the do the the work for him. Yeah, right? it, we have to do that today, Saggy. Because if I think back in my career, right when we had you know some developers and they were all developing code, and I stood up a bunch of systems as the sysadmin, we were all on the same network. We were all connected to the same set of switches. All the applications ran internally. And there wasn't much in the way of security controls because we're like, ah, we're behind a firewall. We're all, you know, we may firewall ourselves off from the rest of the organization. But in our circle, all the users and applications can talk to each other and they're all local, right? Now exactly. you fast forward. And so you, what you ended up with was a lot less rules, right? It was pretty easy. Everything was all in the same subnet, all in the same uh, systems and users and applications. Now when we push out and start moving things into the cloud, whether that's infrastructure or applications, whatever it is, we have a lot more fine-grained control over what's happening. We also have a lot more automation in the processes, which introduces more configuration that can also have security controls, right? Because you've got your, you know, your DevOps tool chain, right? And that's, there's a lot of different points in there. It, now we have the opportunity to make mistakes, right? But I think the opportunity to make it much more secure, but that requires automation. There's no way one person can 
uh, try to implement the rules if you've got even 100 applications. The complexity just gets too great. We have to rely on automation to allow us to apply our higher level, not policy in the terms of firewall policy, right? But our policies that we've defined for the organization. In a higher level. Yeah, exactly. And, and apply those level. via automation, right? So it's, it's, um, it's, it's interesting. So, I mean, you, you, you mentioned the security policy itself, or we, we have what we define as the unified security policy, which tells you what is allowed to go or, you know, kind of tells you the what if scenario, you're going to break this policy or you're going to get You're going to break this policy if you do that. And you told a story of an, the internal system mm -hmm. in, in your previous roles. Um, imagine what happens in an enterprise, right? Mm -hmm. um, thousands of application, nothing is really only internal. There's obviously external communications. There's between departments and you got to have that level of granularity to create even hierarchies at some point so you can control it better. We want to make this easy for the user to manage the security policy. And through that, kind of start um, automating things because if you define a security policy, and again, um, I think you know our CEO was here and he said it as well, you're only as secure as your security policy. And if you don't have a security policy that's properly defined, you really, you really are not secure. As, as much as you think you are, you're not. So. Um, I think it's a, it's an interesting conversation to see that transition, looking into that, what we call a unified security policy, building that out, having trust in this system to help you automate and basically check compliance, help you clean up, help you justify a lot of things that are going on. Um, and if we take it into the next step, which is um, the cloud, the DevOps world, uh, we see the trade-off between business agility and security mm -hmm. even greater than what we've seen before because the pressure is on the security folks a developer you know what he wants he wants to code he wants to build he wants to launch right he doesn't want to deal with the security part sides of it and that's what we want to we want to be able to help him develop feel secure because he knows that everything he builds or everything he codes goes under this security policies type of uh, checks. And then if something comes up, it tells them, just so you know, you're gonna break this. Um, are you sure you wanna do this or not? Now, there are two things to it, right? We can be uh, aggressive and break the build mm. and kind of break the code and tell them, nope, you're not gonna do it. Second option is tell him you kind of let him go ahead with it, but warn him and provide the warning saying, it's okay. It's deployed, but go ahead and fix it um, in your free time. Free time meaning as soon as possible, right? So yeah, and uh, well, and I, I like that model too because you know having put rules in place that can disrupt development makes a lot of people very upset, right? And as a security person, you don't want to stop the business or stop development, exactly. right? Yeah. yeah. And we know there's an acceptable period of time of risk in in most things, right? So we could say, look, you know, you've got a couple of weeks to fix this. In a couple of weeks, if it's not fixed, we'll we'll talk about it. We know it's an issue. We're going to address it. Look, the vulnerabilities and exposures that bite us are the ones we don't know about. The great thing exactly. about automation in DevOps and cloud is we can get notified that all this stuff is happening and know that there's a security policy exception that we've made that's posing some level of risk and have an intelligent conversation about it uh, and, and exactly. work together between sysadmin, security, and developers in order to fix it. Yeah, exactly. And having that level of visibility, which I think is, so again, I'm taking it a step forward from the classic infrastructure type of world, which was uh, the firewall world mm -hmm. with physical firewalls, um, taking it the next step into cloud security, container security, that part, that side of things. Um, again, we talked about, uh, we, wanna, we wanna have those people continue working. You don't want to stop the business, but you want to do have that conversation. As you said, I think it's a very valued conversation and having that visibility into those things. So again, providing you with, for example, you're running a server or you're running a, even a, even a service within the container, um, providing you with a vulnerability scan of that service, letting you know what it's, what is the grade, if it's an A plus, if it's an F, you want to know all these things. Um, and again, letting the security folks have the visibility that they're missing to be able to start the automation journey 
uh, because if you look at uh, what we de- we define like a maturity model of things, mm-hmm. and at the maturity model at the bottom, there is visibility. First of all, you need to see things. Then you have to kind of start doing some compliance checks, some cleanups, then do the design and analysis of things, start automating it, and eventually you're going to get to application-driven as well as zero-touch automation. So again, it's a journey. And for the, for the DevOps world specifically, start off with gaining visibility for the folks who are missing it because the feedback that we get, and again, that's based on a lot of customers and prospects and just people mm. that do this job they daily basis, um, they lack visibility and they lack the side to help them automate, right? Mm. Everyone wants to automate. Everyone's saying, we want to be there, right? You talk to a customer, he said, yeah, we really need to automate. But for us to automate, we first of all have to have visibility into things. We have to be able to do things wisely with the understanding and also share other pieces of the business, other uh, different you know, uh, groups or other people that are involved in that decision because you don't want to be the bad guy just saying no without justifying it or without kind of even, even presenting what is going to happen if you make that change, right? And there's so many different options for cloud providers today. And even if you were focused on just one, doing a lot of that work yourself, at least in my experience, is is like not fun. <laughs> like you need to oh, adopt no. oh, tools. No. And oh, even no. the cloud providers will tell you like, look, yes, we do give you facilities to do this. However, we also let you link in third-party tools. That's what you know Jeremy from Microsoft was saying because we want to support the tools that you want to use to, in Sege, I think your point is right. The first thing is to gain visibility. Then you multiply that out. Now you're in all three major cloud providers from Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. Now you really do need a third-party tool to help tie all those things together. Um, and, and that's a lot of which what uh, Tufin provides is that visibility, especially when you're on-premise and in three different cloud providers or any combination thereof, uh, you need that. I mean, you just you just mentioned three types of just just on the cloud, what happens? And there is no environment that I know that is solely in cloud without running yeah, somewhat yeah. of a of a you know physical infrastructure of running container, looking into container, looking at a lot of other systems. Um, so you know you have what is currently production deployed in production. You have some things that you are testing, yep. probably cloud, the, the platforms you already mentioned, that's already part of the production, but you also want to have the vision looking into the future as an organization, we're going to be deploying things in the cloud. And again, from a transitioning standpoint, if you look into the future, which is always always interesting trying to, we never know, right? But we try to kind of mm. um, estimate what, what, what would be the big, the next big thing and how people will transition and how this world is going to look like in five years. It's going to be a lot of the same with a lot of the cloud and, you know, the serviceless infrastructure, all these type of things. But guess what? The physical world is not going to go away so, so, so fast. Yeah. It's going to be- when I talk to, to practitioners, right, developers, I'm like, so where are you developing? And a lot of times they come back to me and in this particular case, you know, my friend was like, well, we develop locally. He's like, then we push up into Fargate because it's too expensive to put all of our stuff inside of Fargate. So there is going to be this hybrid environment. I mean, for a long time, I mean, the, the cloud is not an insignificant cost and I don't see it dropping that much where, you know, basically we have very little. I think we're still going to have a lot of infrastructure locally. I mean, I mean, it's already there, right? So mm-hmm. you already have it. Some of it you already own. So, as you said, from a cost perspective, mm-hmm. um, you know, cloud is uh, scalable. It's fast. It's fast. It, it's agile. It's not necessarily the most, you know, cost effective. Always, obviously, you know, depends on the use case and depend on the environment. But overall, um, I think it's going to be a combination of everything because you look at the business, you look at cost, you look at agility, um, you know, you look at business impact. Just migrating those things, that's that's a project or projects mm-hmm. of, of, it, of their own, right? Just migrating those infrastructure, which is also something that we see as some things we want to automate, help you migrate. So you take a server, right? You have a physical server. How do you migrate it into the cloud infrastructure? What happens to this server? It has an IP. It changes to a different IP because it's in the cloud. Now it has mm-hmm. an IP that keeps changing. How do you manage that? in your um, 
the hybrid infrastructure, which we just discussed, a huge, huge, huge challenge to uh, everyone who's dealing with this, right? You have um, a firewall, you have a cloud infrastructure, maybe it's a service running container. There's so many out there, so many options. Uh, you got to think of all of them and it's, it's, it's a challenge, right? It's a challenge that uh, we, we are tackling. Absolutely. And if you have those challenges, you can visit securityweekly.com forward slash two fin uh, and get more information, including all of the segments that have aired on our shows talking about these very same issues. Sagi, thank you so much for appearing on Hack Naked News. Oh, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. And with that, we will take uh, not just a short break, but that will conclude the show. And thank you, everyone, for listening and watching. We'll see you next time.